Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to day two of the regional webinar on challenges faced by seafarers and identification of best practices during the COVID-19 pandemic in Asia. Uh, yesterday, you'll recall, we had a number of very distinguished speakers uh, outlining the challenges faced by seafarers. Uh, and I'd like to again thank uh, Mr. Brandt Wagner of ILO, Dr. Ninglang Wang uh, from the World Health Organization, uh, Ishmael Kobas Delgado from IMO, uh, Azar Jomazina from uh, UNSCAP, uh, Banco, Branco Berlan from uh, International Transport Workers Federation and Kuba Szymanski from uh, Intermanager uh, for their very valuable contributions. Uh, I hope that their comments have generated a lot of thought overnight. Uh, I hope they've also generated a lot of action on your part to raise CFAIR issues with all people that need to hear them. Uh, regrettably, we had a slight technical glitch yesterday. Uh, so. Uh, Natalie Shaw from the International Chamber of Shipping was unable to present, so we'll start off this morning uh, by inviting her to uh, deliver her remarks. Uh, I would encourage everybody, uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, the questions will be captured, and if they're not answered today, then uh, we will certainly be looking at answering them in the longer term. Uh, today's program, uh, it's a tight program. We have very distinguished speakers uh, from India, Philippines, Hong Kong, China, Indonesia, and Singapore. So I'll uh, be inviting them to speak shortly. Uh, I will encourage them, please, to focus on the identification of best practice. Uh, what are you doing that's working? Uh, and also, let's see, let's be open and see what things could be done better, particularly in terms of uh, interagency cooperation at national and regional levels. Uh, so without further ado, uh, thank you very much uh, once again, and I'd like to uh, invite uh, Natalie Shaw from ICS to make her remarks. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And um, first, first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving me to speak today. I was sitting there very patiently yesterday, and suddenly, just as I was about to speak, I got up. So hopefully that won't happen today. Now, I've been asked to talk to you today on why seafarers appear to be forgotten during the pandemic. And ICS is extremely concerned, but despite the fact that it's now 10 months on from the, when the virus was first announced, we are still facing many problems in ensuring the human rights of our seafarers are properly respected and honoured. We fully understand the concerns of countries not wishing to see the spread of a disease in their countries, particularly small Pacific island states, which do not believe that they have a capacity to be able to provide medical care and who do not have adequate access to testing kits and appropriate medication and medical resources to manage severe cases of COVID in their countries. However, there is a fundamental problem. Many of these countries have signed up to various pieces of international legislation. UNCLOS from the UN, SOLAS, IMO, MLC 2006, ILO, IHR, WHO, all of which have clear requirements to ensure the provision of free practique and medical assistance to seafarers which are not currently being honoured. If countries are to sign up to conventions in future, they need to ensure that they have the capacity to meet the requirements of the convention and not to abrogate their responsibilities in this regard. Currently, there are a number of seafarers from Kiribati, Myanmar, Tonga and Fiji, to name a few, who cannot leave their vessels as their countries do not have the ability to be able to allow them back home. In addition, seafarers who would have been, um, who would have replaced them from these countries are also unable to leave, therefore causing severe economic hardship for, for them and all their families. There must be a new approach when signing up to international regulation, which have, impact, which have an impact on other government departments. Lessons learned suggest that to date, 
the legislation appears to be predominantly being reviewed by maritime administrations in silos without proper discussions across governmental agencies, and this needs to change. Many countries still perceive seafarers to be potential vectors of a disease. And I can assure you as an industry sector, we have been very careful to work on protocols to mitigate chances of infection from COVID-19, which have been widely promulgated, particularly by IMO under the 4204 series. I'm particularly pleased to report that ICS has worked with other agencies to produce medical guidance um, documents for COVID-19, which have now been updated three times and which are available through the IMO circular um, lists. And we will continue to update these documents until the end of the pandemic. Our next major challenges are to ensure accessibility to testing using a consistent global test and also consistent international approaches to quarantine and also the provision of um, vaccinations early to seafarers as key workers as and when they become available. Without these approaches in, being put in place, seafarers will, I believe, continue to be considered to be second class citizens without the recognition they so clearly deserve for keeping the world moving during the pandemic. I'd also just finally like to mention an initiative which will be launched at the end of this week, hashtag Seafarers Delivering Christmas. This is an interagency initiative um, which is going to be launched to really try to ensure that everybody supports our seafarers in the run up to the festive period, whatever their race or um, creed or religion. And there will be a number of activities that people can get involved with. Supporting the seafarer welfare organisations who have been working incredibly hard during the pandemic. Being able to be involved in a TikTok type video. Um, information on how festivals can be celebrated on board in a safe, in a safe COVID way. Um, telephone calls for seafarers and also support tools for mental health during the pandemic. And I would very much encourage all of you to promulgate these materials. I hope that we can move forward in a positive way and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Well, thank you very much, Natalie, for that uh, presentation, uh, stressing again the need for seafarers to be uh, treated as key workers and I would encourage everybody to get on board with the hashtag seafarers delivering Christmas initiative it's a very important initiative uh, we really have to get the message out there uh, without them we're stuck so uh, moving on to the next session without further ado I'd like to invite uh, Sri Ambed Kumar the director general of shipping uh, for the Government of India on India's response to the seafarers crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic. So you have the floor. I would first like to thank IMO for giving me this opportunity and to profusely apologize to them for my inability to join the earlier uh, seminars. The rights of the Indian seafarers are recognized through Merchant Shipping Act, the right for their identity, remuneration, repatriation, food, water, and sufficient provisions, medical assistance, accommodation, etc., are very well recognized. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 has impacted not only the rights of the seafarers, but has virtually impacted almost each and every component of the maritime sector in different ways, and has taught us the importance of empathy, communication, coordination, and technology to keep the trade running, and has showed us the way as to how we need to function more efficiently in future. Next slide, please. Our response to COVID-19 started much before COVID-19 actually hit India. We created the war room on 11th of February, 2020 itself. And most of our advisories, which were later on converted into orders, 
and SOPs were ready by 20th of March, 2020, uh, way before the nation went for a lockdown on 24th of March. Uh, within a month of the lockdown, we started to change at our ports and then at our anchorages, and we allowed the seafarers to use the bubble flights and charter flights for their sign-on and sign-off. Next slide, please. The key challenges to COVID-19, of course, was to the shipping and to the logistics trade because of the closure of the rail and road transport. The major change that we found, the major threat that we found was that the ships faced at the ports and the ports that uh, faced a perceived threat from the ship and the seafarers. Uh, the major issue we realized was that the seaborne trade was no more only in the hands of the maritime administration, but a very close coordination was required uh, with the central and the state agencies. The ships uh, faced a peculiar problem because they were asked to continue uh, with their normal business, but all the support services on the land, be it the recognized organizations, repair facilities, ground-based support of supervisors, etc., were closed. And the movement of seafarers and the training and their training uh, became completely shut because of the closure of airlines, roadways, trains, and their own offices and the offices of RPS agencies. Next slide, please. We realized that if the shipping is to continue un unhindered, then a lot of discussions and uh, collaboration would be required between our internal stakeholders and the external stakeholders. I had personally conducted at least 300 to 350 meetings with our internal stakeholders. Those are RPS agencies, ship owners, seafarer unions, our doctors who were not very willing to come out and start giving medical certificates, the agents, and most importantly, the ports and the terminals who had to do most of the work. Through ex by external agencies, uh, we had very detailed discussions with the Ministry of Home Affairs, which is our nodal ministry for our Epidemic uh, Act, uh, for, and also for the immigration facilities during this crisis at our seaports. The Ministry of Health, which had to vet the protocols that we were developing for management of ships and for interaction between the ships and the ports, and also for setting up quarantine facilities and testing facilities at our ports. Ministry of Civil Aviation had to be contacted along with almost all airlines uh, for uh, use of bubble flights by the seafarers and for use of chartered flights by them. And most importantly, the state governments, because all our interstate travel was closed, inter and intrastate travel was closed. So to start the inter and intrastate travel for developing quarantine facility and for flight landing permissions, uh, the, the state governments had to be uh, kept in the loop. Next slide, please. As I said, every, almost every sector got impacted. In terms of maritime training, we had to close down the institutes, all the institutes by 20th of March, 2020. We quickly resumed our e-learning modules for them. And by May, we had started online virtual classes for all the seafarers, potential seafarers in the institute. We also, in the month of August, launched an online exam, exit exam for all the modular courses. And uh, uh, to make sure that there is no impersonation, we have developed a photo identification system uh, for attendance and for all kinds of uh, 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 e-learning e or e-exam modules that we have. Uh, COC examinations have now been resumed with very limited capacity. The, so far, we have had 132,000 seafarers who are enrolled 
on our e-learning programs. More than 30,000 have attended our virtual classes and more than 28,000, which has now increased to 30,000, have received digital certificates for completion of their courses. The movement of seafarers was, is uh, the biggest problem uh, that we have faced. If they have faced two problems, one of course is the expiry of their existing certificates. And the second is their movement for sign-on and sign-off purposes. We took initial measures by extending all the certificates, uh, COC and COP, uh, uh, existing certificates. And as I said, we allowed crew change uh, at all our ports and anchorages for first the Indian seafarers. And now we allow sign off of foreign seafarers also to enable them to travel locally, interstate or intrastate. We spoke to the Ministry of Home Affairs and uh, we got the right to issue an online e-pass for the seafarers for their interstate and intrastate travel. And uh, we also facilitated them uh, for uh, the sign-on, sign-off using the charter flights. From 23rd March onwards, we have facilitated uh, travel of 191,000 uh, seafarers at both our ports and uh, uh, outports using bubble flights and charter flights. Uh, for ships, as we all know, uh, we started with a disease outbreak management plan in the, in the month of March. And then we developed detailed uh, SOPs and guidelines for the ships on 16th March, along with SOPs for the ports and all the statutory certificates, surveys, audits uh, had to be extended because of the closure of uh, uh, the services uh, at the ground. But we managed to, uh, to allow the ships to sail uh, during this period. Next slide, please. The ports uh, do not come under the purview of DG shipping, but for the purposes of COVID-19, we felt that all the ports should follow the SOPs that are designed by DG. Otherwise, uh, we have around 48, 49 uh, ports with exim trade. We were looking at 49 different SOPs for the ships, which would have been impossible for the exim trade to follow. So we developed an SOP for pilotage operation, PHO, that is health uh, op uh, officers, uh, ship sanitation plan, port calls uh, by ships and quarantine facilities and uh, PPEs for our uh, cargo operators. And uh, the SOP was also developed in the month of March itself for handling emergency cases, including uh, cases uh, with COVID-19. And uh, all these cases uh, with uh, requirement of medical uh, assistance were accepted at Indian ports. The ports continued to be operational. Uh, we had to give a lot of uh, assistance to our exim trade also because, uh, because of the closure of the rail and road. The containers uh, kept piling on, uh, up on our ports. And uh, we uh, advised our shipping lines and shipping companies to desist from charging of detention charges and other penal charges for uh, the containers. And similar dispensation were given for non-containerized cargo also. The shipping industry e equally felt the pinch of the lockdown. Uh, we first... Uh, 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 encourage them to have doctors on board uh, to manage the uh, ship management plan. And we slowly permitted the OEMs, uh, uh, technicians, surveyors, vetting inspectors, technical superintendents, auditors to board the vessel uh, after following the SOP prescribed. Uh, we lifted uh, the restrictions on ship owners and RPS agencies and allowed them to start uh, uh, attending their offices sometime in the month of May. Uh, next slide, please. None of uh, these activities would have been possible had we not adopted, uh, adapted and adopted the technology. We first, the office of DG Shipping itself became completely online and I allowed almost 90% of my staff to work from home. 
uh, we developed uh, uh, quickly a utility for movement of our seafarers uh, for their interstate and intrastate transfer. And EPOS module was developed. We uh, were allowed to use charter flights, but before that, we had to ensure that the passengers were only seafarers. We okay. developed a small utility to verify the passenger manifest for all these charter flights. Two for minutes, training, please, DJ. Yes. Could I please ask you to summarize in two minutes? Thank you. And similar uh, uh, things were developed for uh, e-learning and for uh, uh, for uh, 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 stranded seafarers and online registration of vessels. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, we have already uh, facilitated movement of 190,000. Next slide, please. Uh, that we have approved 317 charter flights of 70,000, almost people have traveled, sorry, 60,000. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, all the three modes put together have been put to equal use. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The war room that we created was of great assistance and almost all the requests have been processed in two to three hours, a maximum six hours uh, because of the existence of war room. Next slide, please. For continuation of the supply side of seafarers, uh, training has become uh, extremely essential. Uh, more than 36,000 uh, people have utilized our three-tier training module the three-tier training module is e-learning, virtual class, and online exit examination. And if you complete all three, then you become entitled for a certificate. So nearly 36,000 have appeared so far, and 30,000 have cleared. We have issued more than 30,000, almost 30,000 uh, digitally signed certificates for these uh, seafarers. Uh, next slide. That is the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I would request uh, you to take us to the last slide of uh, seafarers uh, uh, giving their exams and uh, uh, signing off and signing off at Indian ports. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, DG, for that uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, Participants will be relieved to know that we will put all the slides uh, onto the IMO website so they can uh, pick up the information which, sadly, due to time, you had to whistle through. But thank you very, very much for that. Uh, my next speaker is Vice Admiral uh, Robert Empedrad, uh, the Administrator of Marina, uh, the, uh, the Philippines, uh, addressing the Philippines' response to seafarers crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and before uh, the Admiral starts. I would also point out we have a question uh, directed towards him uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so it's reported that a few governments are discouraging ships manned by Filipino seafarers to call into their ports due to many being infected with the virus, allegedly. Uh, the Philippines being one of the largest seafarer export nations needs to look into this matter. What measures are being taken by Marina to address this? Uh, you if you could cover that during your presentation, I'd be very grateful, sir. I answered the chat and uh, I, I answered the one who questioned that one through chat. But, um, okay. but the more important intervention that the government of the country has done is to create a one-stop shop, uh, which is being established at the piers and at the international airports, so that uh, the conduct of the RT-PCR testing of the seafarers, the quarantine of the seafarers, the processes of the crew chains are done uh, in the one-stop shop. This will uh, um, uh, impede the, or restrict the movement of seafarers from moving from one place to another and ensure, uh, in that way, we can ensure that the seafarers do not have the COVID when they are employed in ships. So uh, we strengthen the intervention of the government uh, as far as the movement of seafarers are concerned. So that's how I, uh, I can answer the question being raised. Thank you, sir. If you'd uh, please carry on with your presentation. Yeah. Well, uh, pleasant uh, day to everyone, Chris, and a special greeting to our uh, Secretary General, uh, Kita Kleed. Uh, first of all, allow me to convey my sincerest appreciation to the IMO 
for inviting the maritime delegates of the Philippines to this forum. I am pleased to have this opportunity to pr present with you initiatives and measures that we have undertaken, undertaken to respond to the challenges posed by COVID-19. Our country being the one of the major suppliers of shipboard manpower for the international shipping industry. We all know the paramount importance of the marit maritime industry in the world. There are around 100,000 ships that carry almost 95% of the world's trade. These ships are operated by close to 1.5 million seafarers coming from various nationalities. And one out of four of these seafarers are Filipinos. Next slide, please. The end of COVID-19 pandemic is perhaps one of the biggest blows, not only to our industry, but also across all economies in the world. We all have been witness to its unprecedented impact the lives of people. In the maritime sector, a number of ports have been forced to close, thereby affecting the supply chain and have caused thousands of seafarers to be stranded aboard ships. Like doctors, nurses, seafarers have continued to work day and night while com combating fear, anxiety, great risk to their own health to keep the world trade afloat. Thus, the Philippine Interagency Task Force for Emerging Diseases issued a resolution declaring seafarers as key workers or what we call authorized person outside residence so as not to impede the movement of our seafarers when they are deployed or when they are deployed. Recognizing the role of our seafarers, the Maritime Industry Authority came out with 75 initiatives and I would like to mention a few of these. An advisory uh, for the, the one-year extension of the STCW certificate issued to seafarers that will expire from 13 March to 31 December for a period of one year. In addition, seafarers with expi expiring certificates may process the renewal of their certificate even without the required refresher trainings or practical assessment of competence as long as they comply with the minimum requirement of seagoing service. We also extended the seafarers record book, seafarers identification and record books for a period of one year, those that will expire from 31 March to 31 December 2020. We also emphasize uh, to the body that our seafarers can now renew their certificates fully online, payment fully online, and their certificates will be delivered soon through courier services so that they, need, they don't need to proceed to the Maritime Industry Authority to file or to apply for their statutory certificates. Finally, the marina gave the go signal for the maritime training Indonesia, and also as the Indonesian national focal point on crew change and repatriation of seafarers. It is truly an honor for me to join this important webinar despite the current global pandemic. We are all encountering this period of time. Our hearts and minds go to those who have lost their life and their family. Our highest appreciation to all medical and health personnel who have been tirelessly and bravely standing in the front line to combat this uh, horrendous pandemic. On this occasion, I would like to deliver an recent position on challenge faced by seafarers and identification of best practice during the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Uh, the global pandemic of COVID-19 is indeed an unprecedented and one of a kind situation that we all have to endure. COVID-19 poses great challenges and difficulties for the global world. Therefore, Indonesia has issued a circular letter of the Director General of Sea Transport Ministry of Transportation concerning national framework 
of repatriation and crew change of the ship crew and services during coronavirus diseases this is to uh, 2019 COVID-19 pandemic and stipulate Indonesian standard operating operation procedure SOP of repatriation and crew change of the ship's crew and services at the established port during COVID-19 pandemics. So our presentation today uh, focus on how we conduct the repatriation rather than the educational uh, training and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the process of establishing at least 11 Indonesia port for the repatriation and crew change. Um, maybe move to the next slide. <clears throat> next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next, next slide. Yeah, uh, this is the picture on the maps. Uh, which one? Uh, that that uh, we. I think so. Yeah. Namely, Blawan on the west part of Indonesia, and up to Sorong on the east part of Indonesia, and. The facilitation of the crew change of foreign ship is by implementing national procedure and WHO health protocol, coordinated with the ship owner, principals, and or agents. Ship owner or principal must submit a commitment letter related to compliance with the COVID-19 test inspection standard and the quarantine provision for the crew in reducing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic to the crew when conducting repatriation and crew change. Integrated services include the information of pre ship arrival, arrival, deprecation or embarkation, CIQS process, medical examination of COVID-19, places for COVID-19 quarantine or isolation, land transportation and connecting flight home. Currently, there are no restriction on type of vessel for crew change. Moreover, in the event of medical uh, emergency experience by a foreign crew while the ship is in port, the crew can be disembarked from the ship after obtaining permission from the COVID-19 tax, tax force in their respective area. After going through the COVID-19 handling her protocol, and the medical team of port office can handle medical emergencies with the availability of adequate medical facilities and equipment and or immediately refer to the hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, as per October 2020, Indonesia has gotten 24,542 Indonesian crew to their home with detail 5,507 persons via port of Tanjung Priok, 1,540 persons via port of Benoa, 39 persons via Halim Perdana Kusuma Airport, 9,192 9, persons via Sukarno Hatta Airport, and 8,264 persons via Igusti Murah Rai Airport. Meanwhile, regarding the procedure for repatriating foreign crew change, Indonesia has issued DGST circular letter number SE 13 of 20, 2020. Uh, this one on the earlier earlier March 2020 and uh, SE number nine on June 2020 on repatriation and crew change service. Foreigner crew change in Indonesia theoretically can be implemented in five port, namely Pulau Nipah, Tanjung Balai Karimun, Pulau Galang, Tanjung Priok, and Benoa. By complying with the existing protocol of course of the crew, repatriation program will, will continue. Ladies and gentlemen, in the end, it is not only the government that must be responsible for repatriation of ship crew. The implementation of repatriation and crew change involves ship owner, ship operator, ship agency company, crew requirement and placement company, as well as their commitment to their responsibility to the crew. Moreover, since the regulation or provision in each country 
are different, there need to be several mutual agreement if these activities become an obligation for the member country. At last, but not least, we believe that by protecting seafarers, we also protect the world's economy in this fragile situation. And then for the further cooperation for any, any flag state that need to discuss regarding repatriation in Indonesia ports, welcome uh, to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that very useful information. Uh, and I'm sure we'll come back to it shortly. Uh, my final speaker this morning, this afternoon, uh, is Mr. Go Chun Hung, who is the Director Shipping of the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. Uh, on Singapore's response, so you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on which part of the world you are tuning in from. Greetings from the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, and thank you, IMO, for having me on this forum today. Firstly, on the important role that seafarers play. Much has been said about the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic, the global maritime industry is currently facing one of its most significant humanitarian crises, and that is in relation to seafarers. Seafarers play a frontline role in global trade and are essential to keep global supply chains flowing. Since the start of the pandemic, seafarers have encountered major challenges in undertaking crew change. This is due to port shutdowns, travel restrictions imposed by countries, as well as reduced availability of commercial flights. There are various estimates of the numbers of seafarers currently stranded on board ships and who are unable to be released from their duties. Suffice to say, there are many of them. They face the risk of becoming overly fatigued and mentally exhausted which would be detrimental to the safe operations of ships. As a global hub port and international maritime center, Singapore recognizes the important role we play in helping to tackle this crisis. We must do the right thing, and we need to do it right so that we are able to facilitate crew change safely. Now on the slide on your screen, on Singapore's efforts for crew change, the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore has worked closely with the industry and unions to develop a safe corridor to facilitate safe and coordinated crew change for all nationalities from ships of different flags calling into the port of Singapore. This includes quarantine of the seafarers at the home country for a specified period of time and mandating pre-departure test and fit for travel certification in their home countries before departing for Singapore. When they arrive in Singapore, they are bubble wrapped from their arrival at the airport to their ships to minimize contact with the local community. For crew signing off from ships in Singapore port and traveling back home, the same bubble wrap concept applies. Next slide, please. Next, I will also touch upon Singapore's other initiatives with regard to facilitating crew change. The Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore with the support from our port operator, PSA International, has also established a dedicated crew facilitation center at Tanjong Pagar Terminal in September 2020. The self-contained crew facilitation center, which features an on-site medical center as well, is used to house sign-on crew prior to their boarding of ships. Similarly, the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore has also designated other holding facilities hotel to accommodate seafarers who sign off from ships prior to taking their flight. Now, to strengthen international crew change and to promote the adoption of best practices by seafaring nationals, MPA works with the Singapore Maritime Officers Union, SMOU, and Singapore Organization of Seamen, SOS, other industry partners, and also international organizations to set up a Singapore dollar 1.68 million tripartite alliance resilience fund, uh, SG star fund in short. Yeah, seafarers are essential to keep global supply chains flowing. We will continue to do our part 
in alleviating the humanitarian crisis through our crew change efforts. While we review and constantly update our processes in order to mitigate public health risks. Since 27 March 2020, Singapore has facilitated, facilitated more than 52,000 crew changes in the port of Singapore. And we continue to do so every day. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we ha now have a few minutes left for Q&A, uh, so uh, I would encourage anybody to uh, add some more questions because I'm paid to be here so I can keep this going as long as you want to stay for. Uh, to start off with, uh, we've had a question uh, directed at Mr. Quang Shi of Hong Kong. If the medical certificates are extended, how long is this for? And also, what steps or process do you observe to ensure that the seafarer is still indeed fit for work at sea? Could I ask Mr. Quang Shi to address that? Yes. Um, yes, actually, that is, we have an application process in place, and uh, I can send the details to the inquiry and after the meeting. And also uh, the period, how long we can extend, also depends on official announcement from the Certificate Issuing Authority, thus we will take that into consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be grateful if you could share that with IMO as well so we can let the world know. Uh, and I have another question uh, specific this time to uh, Admiral Ampradad uh, of Marina. Uh, please again confirm uh, with regard to STCW basic safety survival certificates and proficiency certificates can be renewed online. Oh, yeah. Um, good, good afternoon again to everyone. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, all, all the statutory certificates of our seafarers can now be applied or uh, renewed online. Uh, everything. Uh, we, we have uh, created a, pass, uh, uh, a, a platform uh, online, uh, full, fully digitalized uh, online platform that all seafarers, all the certificates that they want to renew can be done online. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, question to all panelists, if, if you wish to take it, please uh, use the raise hand function or wave. Uh, uh, may I know, is there any regional one-stop center in Asia to confirm procedures in place for crew change in every member state? Would anybody like to address that? A regional one-stop center in Asia. Okay, well, we're thinking about that. Uh, there's another question saying, what can individual seafarers who find themselves stuck on board do? I'm in contact with some crew who've been on board for over 17 months and who are increasingly desperate to get home. What options exist for them practically to ensure that they are relieved? Uh, Mr. Kumar, sir, please. Uh, for both the questions, for uh, sign off at Indian ports, the SOP is available at our website. Uh, and the same SOP is used at all our ports. So that is, uh, that should be the one stop shop. Uh, for uh, the second question, I forgot your question. Uh, yes, the, uh, the question was, what can individual seafarers who find themselves yeah. stuck on board do? So, uh, we have developed an online uh, grievance uh, system and all the seafarers who are awaiting repatriation can log themselves online on that system. And uh, that is uh, reviewed uh, uh, on day-to-day -day basis. And then we get in touch with our local embassies to see that the seafarer gets repatriated as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, if anybody else wishes to come in on this, please, uh, please do yes, so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Indonesia. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, according our experience, actually, the government do a lot of uh, effort to uh, 
make the SOP of the repatriation of crew. But of course, this is the most important factor is the company itself. Uh, I believe that, that uh, some company, they still uh, don't like to, uh, uh, to conduct the crew change. This is happened uh, because we have also report from the individual seafarers who the company uh, does uh, do, do not like to, to relieve them. Uh, the government, for instance, Indonesia government is only have the uh, authority for the Indonesian flag. So the seafarers from Indonesia who work on the uh, foreign flag, it is quite difficult for us to control them. That is why it look like we need to have some uh, common agreement between the between the uh, between the uh, flag state to to do this. And of course, for the Asia one stop center, I believe that uh, Indonesia we have what we call by push local, and uh, the number contact number is myself. I will uh, share my number uh, on the chat room uh, for the uh, others. Uh, administration and so on, who look like to discuss, want to discuss regarding the crew repatriation from, from, from other country in Indonesia support. That's all. Great, thank you very much. Okay, we have another question. Uh, during this pandemic, the cost for seafarer expatriations are getting higher due to local government requirements, such as special insurance, quarantine, etc., which are borne by the ship owner. Do we have any solution to reduce such costs so we can assist better on seafarer expatriation? Thank you. Anybody like to take that? Otherwise, I shall volunteer. Uh, Mr. Hun, please, you're smiling. It's always a mistake. Yeah. Uh, OK, I, I, I do not have the silver bullet answer to this. I do understand that uh, increased costs because uh, of uh, uh, reduction of flight. Uh, sometimes the owners have to resort to chartered flight. Uh, even the holding facilities and hotels, uh, after a crew checkout, there is the deep clean sanitization cost involved. So, but I think uh, if ship owners uh, or managers uh, can uh, better plan uh, on where you can uh, uh, do your crew change, I think that would help. And I think uh, also apart from ship owners and ship managers, Charters also have a very important role to play. So it is uh, not just a single party. Uh, various parties have to come together. Of course, uh, speaking on, uh, on, from Singapore's perspective as a, as a major flag and as a major port, uh, as a flag, we follow up closely with all the operators of uh, Singapore registered ships. And uh, we are keeping tab on the number of, uh, Singapore, the number of seafarers sailing on board Singapore flagships that are near to or is going to uh, 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 go beyond their MLC uh, stipulated limit of a uh, contract on board. And uh, as a port, uh, I have presented earlier, we try to facilitate crew changes as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is anybody, yes, please, uh, Admiral, please. Um, yes, uh, we have good government intervention to um, alleviate the plight of our seafarers. Like for instance, uh, the uh, government has released a budget to, um, to pay the RT-PCR or the health uh, protocols or the testing of the COVID-19 of our seafarers for free. Um, and the other um, uh, intervention is uh, we opened our uh, various ports for inter as an international hub for crew change so that will uh, bring down the expenses of um, doing crew chains uh, here in the Philippines, uh, instead of going from uh, uh, one uh, area to the other in our country, they can, they can do crew chains all over the archipelago, so it will uh, reduce the spending of doing crew chains. Uh, so that's all, uh, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to now invite my colleague, uh, Ismail Delgado, Co uh, Ismail Cobas Delgado from Maritime Safety Division, who has a hand raised, if you'd like to yeah, thank you, Chris. Well, this is this is uh, rather related to the previous question, and I think this is a message for all seafarers in the world. 
it was related to what can they do when when they feel or they have been stranded on board ships for um, an extended period of time. Please do not forget that we have the IMO Seafarers Crisis Action Team. It is there. It may be perhaps a last resort, but we deal with individual cases. We liaise at a diplomatic level with administrations and the industry, and we try to do our, our best to assist them in order to, to achieve this uh, desired crew change. So we are there. Perhaps it's a, a last resort, but do not forget that we, we are there to assist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd also like to invite uh, Mr. Kumar uh, to give his thoughts. Here you have your, have your hand raised, sir. Uh, uh, two things that we uh, we felt that uh, that was resulting in very high cost of crew change was of course testing and uh, quarantine. Uh, we we felt that uh, if we allow the seafarers the time that they have spent on board ship uh, from the last port of call uh, as period of quarantine. Uh, then the total period of quarantine required at the land side would, uh, would be reduced substantially. And in our SOP, we have made that amendment and we count the period of quarantine from the date the ship has left the last port of call. Uh, and uh, uh, that has helped uh, many ship owners in, in their crew change. Because once you are on ship and you have not uh, interacted with anyone on land, the chances of uh, getting infected uh, uh, are next to normal, uh, next to zero. So if that practice can be can be followed by others, maybe the overall cost of crew change will uh, come down substantially. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to comment on that particular question? Okay. Uh, we have another question uh, for seafarers having STCW certificates issued by other states other than their own flag state, such as MCA UK. Uh, is the approach the same as we've heard today? Do all flag states take the same approach in extending, renewing, issuing any statutory certificates? It would be easy for every party to have a uniform standard set by IMO. Uh, please. Uh, Mr. Kwangshi. Okay, I, I think IMO do have this uh, circular and provide some guidance regarding the certifications. And as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, this uh, in for Hong Kong flagships, and uh, this applies the extension applies to uh, uh, foreign seafarers who are holding uh, another uh, authority issued uh, COCs. We only extend our endorsement based on those. COCs, which could be extended by the ECO authority. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, just a reminder that uh, all the information put out by IMO uh, is available on our website. This is all guidance relating to uh, seafarer issues and COVID-19. So uh, to our wider audience, please don't hesitate to look at the website. And the final question I have at the moment is, Oh, sorry, I'd, uh, Ismail, please. Yeah, th thank you, Chris. Well, uh, in relation to this question, we can say that the approach um, has, hasn't has been uniform across the board. Mm. So different countries have taken different approaches, which has been quite complex sometimes. We have, we have recorded all these different approaches, but I can tell you what we did in the circular letter that, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, Chris, is 4204 at 5, we are asking um, states to take a pragmatic and practical approach in relation to CFRS documents and certificates. And uh, we are also asking uh, poor state control um, authorities and regimes to take a pragmatic approach when they have to come on board ships and, and conduct inspections. This doesn't mean that the approach has been uniform. I agree that perhaps a, um, a guidance um, could help, but this is a guidance to be developed by member states. And we need to, to find this opportunity to develop this guideline, these guidelines or guidance to help uh, to achieve this uniform approach. But it's, it's not an easy task because uh, different countries have different systems and they have applied different solutions to, to address this problem. 
with regards to, to endorsements, um, most of the countries, what they have done is just to um, look at the COC in origin, where they have been issued, and then apply extensions for the endorsements accordingly, as, um, as has already been explained. But this is the situation now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Branko, please. Uh, thank you, Branko Berlan from the ITF. And I thank all the participants of this day a webinar in regard to the cool change and problems that COVID brings. However, the position of the ITF, and it's obvious for all of us, there is not pragmatic nor, or practical any extension of the certificates. That means certificates, and that's the ITF position for sure, and it's position from the uh, June this year, actually, on the, on the June 15, we we launched the, the actions in regard enough is enough because it's not only related to the crude change, but it's also other things like, for example, extension. And we know well of the agreements. And that's why your question in regard to these 17 months, it's really, really tricked me, uh, trigger me to, to say something about, yeah, there is no possibility to extend the agreements, for example, for a 17 months, if they wish so, why? Because 11 months put in at the MLC, it's not because does the people wish to go on board more or less, it's about the safety. And all other things are about the safety. COCs and COPs, as well as the medical certificates are not related to the, do they wish or do they have to do so? It's about the safety of them and safety of shipping. So. We'll really like to say that the extension is not acceptable at all. Any extension in regard to the certificates, agreements, medicals, whatsoever. So new solutions have to come. And we, we will like to see more cooperation between the governments because industry did, I think, did made their task quite good. And we don't believe that after eight months, the excuse of First majeure is acceptable at, uh, also. So thank you all and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what role do seafarer charities play in the region and how do you interact with them? Anybody? Mr. Hun? Yeah, thank you. Uh, over in Singapore, we have the uh, Seafarers uh, region, the mission to Seafarer and the Norwegian missions uh, as, as Seafarers charity. And uh, we work closely with them uh, as a, a government authority, the MPA, uh, at various uh, events. And they provide, uh, we have drop in centers where Seafarers can come in, uh, come ashore, go to the drop in centers, make a call home, have internet access, etc. And also we have uh, events uh, annually like the, the Day of the Seafarer and especially so during this period where we uh, distributed gift packages to ships that are in Singapore port at that point in time. So the missions and the charities uh, serve a, a, a very important role because uh, a lot of them also can uh, do certain functions like gift counseling and uh, uh, advice to the seafarers and they can talk and they, they are well trained in, in that aspect. So that's how we are, and we work together with the uh, with the charities uh, in in uh, Singapore port. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've got two suggestions uh, in in the the chat and Q and A, and I'll ask each of you to address those in your final summing up remarks. So one is uh, I strongly suggest that IMO. Uh, should at least issue guidelines allowing for a number of sailing days that will be part of quarantine days, uh, the policy uh, suggested by uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, and also another proposal, uh, I'd like to propose that member states in Asia consider working together to establish a unified protocol for crew change. This will make it easier for ship owners and operators to plan their logistic requirements. So if I could ask you, uh, in, in turn to uh, address those and any final remarks you may have, starting with Mr. Kumar, please. Uh, 
theoretically i would agree with uh, both the suggestions uh, wholeheartedly but uh, in practice uh, we should also realize that we are in very uh, peculiar circumstances uh, health uh, in most of the countries if it follows a federal structure uh, is a state subject and uh, when it comes to health and epidemic uh, the states uh, have equal right to legislate and uh, mere uh, national legislation may not be enough uh, we should have a, a protocol uh, which uh, should become a guideline for the states to follow and of course uh, it is for us in in a federal structure to uh, keep the keep the states on board Uh, all our federal constituents on board to make sure that uh, a uniform guideline is followed uh, we have so far managed to have a uniform guideline uh, which is being used by all our 26 states uh, uniformly uh, if uh, a guideline is prepared by imo uh, which of course it, it will take time for all states to uh, come to an agreement to that uh, guideline Uh, but that would be a good uh, starting uh, uh, place for all the states to follow okay uh admiral emperdat please uh could you unmute your microphone sir please uh yes this uh, uh it's very hard to have a unified protocol of blue chains uh, among other nations because we have different circumstances i think the best way is to uh, share best practices and probably it can be adopted by uh, other other countries um, uh, but to come up with a unified protocol of blue chains that would be very tough uh, it, it needs uh, continuous um, engagement and communication on how to improve the system but i think uh, the best way is to just share our best practices and be adopted by other countries i think we need to communicate uh, every time and then that we change our uh, systems our uh, protocol uh, as far as blue chains is concerned thank you uh, mr kwang shi your thoughts and final remarks please yeah i thank you for the suggestion but uh, i i think we we need some uh, guidance but more importantly is the actions of the individual ports that make cool change possible so let's take hong kong for example uh, we we keep, we keep our cool change uh, even without uh, imo has published any guidance uh, for the cool change or protocols it, it's just more important for every port just to keep their cool change open and that is more important than uh, and hundreds of guidelines and protocols that is my idea thank you okay thank you very much uh captain priyadi please thank you again that uh, i agree with two uh, proposed proposal yeah what uh, you mentioned uh, first regarding the uh, 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 num- uh, the number of the days before ship coming to the port is also include uh, the quarantine and uh, this is also uh, uh, practice implemented in indonesia port uh, uh, but uh, more than that i believe that the guidelines when we uh, when we uh, establish the guideline we need also to include uh, the seafarers itself i mean yes port may do some things uh, flat sticks may do some things but seafarers also input on the garden what uh, they will do when the ship manager they don't allow the crew to uh, repatriate what supposed to be done by the seafarers i think include that one so each party on the on the on the uh, crew change uh, they have a, a guideline to 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 be follow thank you very much and the last word mr han please ah uh, thank you chris uh with regard to the uh, day spin as see as part of the quarantine uh for singapore port we do practice that uh for crew signing off in singapore port 
we require that the crew has been on board 14 days without going ashore. And then uh, there's no quarantine in Singapore when they sign off. They, they can sign off and go home. On the second item about uh, standardized uh, crew change procedures and protocols, Okay, for Singapore, we actually work with the unions and the industry to come up with the Singapore Crew Change Guidebook, which uh, IMO has kindly helped to disseminate as well to an IMO circular. Uh, but having said that, I also agree with Admiral Robert from Philippines, who made it a point that uh, it is difficult to be uh, one size fits all, because a lot depends on national circumstances. Singapore is not a very big country, but I can imagine in another big country, the port might be far away from where the international airport is. So crew change also involves domestic travel. So there, there are differing national circumstances. So the crew change uh, regime and protocol might be slightly different. But sharing of best practices and adoption of best practices is definitely a good idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I summarise, I could, if I could just ask uh, Ismail to uh, tell our listeners how uh, the IMO SCAT can be contacted, please. Ah, okay. We will certainly get that information out. The detailed information will be is on the IMO website. If you look on there, uh, the the link was given in the chat earlier. Uh, and also on the opening slides, uh, you can certainly contact it through that. Uh, what has become clear over yesterday and today is that this is a vital issue uh, for the world's economy, for COVID recovery, uh, for meeting sustainable development goals. It's quite clear that seafarers need to be treated as uh, key workers and facilitated accordingly. What's also becoming very clear or has been very clear is the need for interagency cooperation at local levels, at port levels, at, region, at national level and regionally. Uh, we can all find 150 reasons why we can't do something, but we need to get crack on and fix this. Identifying best practice, sharing information, communicating what works and improving a lot of the seafarers themselves. That's the message we've got out of this. Thank you very, very much uh, yesterday's speakers uh, and also today's uh, very impressive um, cast. Uh, Sri Kumar, uh, Admiral Ampradad, uh, Kang Shi, uh, Captain Priyadi and uh, Mr. Hun and not forgetting Natalie Shaw from ICS. Uh, thank you very much for your inputs. Uh, the recording, the information that you provided, I appreciate you didn't have time to present all your slides but never mind they will be made available uh, on the website as will the recordings of uh, this presentation it will all be fed into the mix uh, we're running these regional seminars around the world so we're trying to get best practice from everywhere uh, because one size doesn't fit all but we can pick the best bits so thank you very much thank you very much to our participants uh, listeners uh, and good luck thank you and don't forget hashtag seafarers delivering christmas thank you Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you.